Casual Birder Podcast, a show for people interested in wild birds. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I try to find time to watch birds as I go about my daily tasks. Join me each week to hear about the birds I've seen, interviews with others and stories from listeners around the world. I've recently returned from a whale watching tour in Baja, California in Mexico, led by conservationist broadcaster and wildlife photographer Mark Carwardine. Travelling by boat, the tour began in San Diego and took us down the Pacific coast of Mexico before rounding the southern tip of Baja, California and sailing up into the Sea of Cortez. Along the way we saw many species of whales and dolphins and I saw over 40 species of birds. Mark is a renowned whale expert and I was delighted to talk with him while we were away about the animals we'd been seeing. Mark, thank you so much for joining me on the Casual Birder podcast. Pleasure. Uh, We're sitting here on the spirit of adventure in the Sea of Cortez, joined by about a dozen pelicans just over, over the edge, and we're here on a fantastic, amazing, astounding whale watching holiday that you run. You said earlier in the week that you have made this trip over 60 times has there been anything this trip that's particularly stood out for you uh yeah there'd been lots it's interesting you know, i think this is my um 66th trip in baja and uh, you'd have thought by now i'd have seen it all and done it all and it, that's so far from the truth there's so much wildlife here um and there's so many different encounters that every single trip is is memorable and different and and uh, unlike any other you know you see certain things on pretty much every trip there's certain places you go certain species you see and you know you're going to see them but in between there are all these other things that just happen on a whim and I can honestly say that no two trips are anything like the same you know this trip uh, I can think of half a dozen encounters that really stand out so much I will always remember them you know I mean one we had uh, just last night blue whales or a, a particularly one blue whale that was lunge feeding at the surface and I think the last time I saw anything like that was seven or eight years ago wow. so it, it, I think that's why I keep coming back and never going to get to the stage where I think right that's it I've seen everything I'm not going to see anything new and I always get off the boat thinking oh my god that was amazing that's just wonderful to hear because knowing that you've Oh, nearly got hit, <laughs> hit by pelican, pelican wings. It was going to land right yeah, next to us. Gosh, I think he wants to yeah, be on the podcast. Feathers just brushed my cheeks almost. <laughs> oh, that's a moment. Um, yeah, knowing that you've been so many times, you could understand people getting jaded. But I can tell from your enthusiasm, even when you're describing what we might see each day, you're so fired up by the thoughts of the animals, and the, the birds and the whales that we might see. Um, have you always liked animals? What, where, where has your interest come from? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky. I mean, this is my office, really, when you think about it. Um, and it's a, a lovely place to be. I could, I could live here and still, you know, get lots of pleasure out of it. I, I've always wanted to work with animals. Always oh, another one nearly landed on your wow. shoulder there. Um, <laughs> I've always wanted to work with animals since I was a kid. Never wanted to do anything else. You know, when I was sort of growing up, I used to keep injured birds and look after them and all the rest of it and I it was natural for me to do a zoology degree Um, and then after that it's just one stroke of luck after another I've just fallen into doing various things and been very lucky to spend my whole working life working with animals of one kind or another doing things like this or out there researching or taking photographs And and the nice thing is that there's a big gray area between my work and my pleasure so if I was taking a holiday I'd probably do a trip like this, you know, I can't get enough of it. Some of the whales we've seen here have been absolutely amazing. We've, we've seen fin whales, uh, sperm whales, blue whales, the grey whales in yeah. San Ignacio Lagoon. Now, those ones come down here to breed, but I was stunned to hear that there's actually no food for them down here. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the grey whales that we've seen? Yeah, they blow my mind. I mean, they what happens is they spend the winter down in Baja and they breed in uh, three different lagoons. San Ignacio, the one we went to, is one of them. And there's another one south of there called Magdalena Bay and one north called Scammons Lagoon. And they, they literally 
go over a very shallow sandbank and then they gather in this this almost like a, a lake it's, it's so enclosed it's a, like an inland lake and they spend the winter there they mate and they give birth to their calves and then when they finish they they leave the lagoon turn right go north and they migrate all the way up the coast of Baja all the way up California Oregon Washington British Columbia round to Alaska the whole North American coastline then they go through a little pass in the Aleutian Islands and then start spreading out all over the Bering Sea and the Chukchai Sea and the Beaufort Sea um, and the ones that are as far away as they go and I've seen one myself off the coast of Chukotka on the northern Siberian coast which was I measured it 6,000 miles away from San Ignacio Lagoon and I actually recognized that whale that I've been seeing in San Ignacio Lagoon on and off for many many years got a big white circle under its dorsal fin with a squiggly black bit in the middle so I recognized the whale the whale didn't recognize me sadly I was very upset about that but I, I saw it feeding off Chukotka so they feed there in the summer and then they migrate all the way back and on the migration and while they're here in Baja in San Ignacio Lagoon and the other lagoons they don't feed at all there's no food for them so what's amazing is that a, a female grey whale will will mate in, in San Ignacio Lagoon migrate 6,000 miles to feed feed all summer and then migrate back again and give birth to the calf and not eat that whole period so she will not eat for maybe six months and give birth to a calf, raise the calf, get it back to the feeding grounds, and then um, they go their separate ways. It's extraordinary. That's amazing. And it was so stunning to see the grey whales in the lagoon. They seem to be really interested in, in seeing the humans. And I think you said that possibly it's through boredom that they've got... Well, I think it is. I think what we, when you think about it, they're in the lagoon, they're not feeding... Um, they're either just a mate or give birth and then raise a calf. And if, whoops, that was close. Was that a pelican? Another pelican yeah. tried to land on the side. Um, and even if they're raising a calf, they, they, they feed it milk every so often, but not all day and all night. So they're twiddling their thumbs, their flippers, you know, for much of the time. And, and we're perfect distractions. So we go out there in our little boats called pangas and... Um, it's very interesting to watch because we're not chasing after the whales we're going out slowly we wait and we see if they come to us and very often they do and somebody described it brilliantly saying because the mothers actually push the calves up to the boat sometimes they'll encourage the calves to play so we're the sort of equivalent to a grey whale of an iPad you know <laughs> that your mother gives the, the child an iPad and says play with that for while I cook supper or whatever <laughs> Um, and we're just a distraction and often the calves are quite nervous when they're young but the mums will push them up make them play and then by the time they get to a month or two old they they love it and they they enjoy playing with the people and you know normally with wildlife you would encourage people not to touch uh, you know it's right to be hands off and just to observe but if you go to San Ignacio you'll see that this is an exception where it's all on their terms and, and you it's a bit anthropomorphic but they get as much out of it as we do. And it really was an amazing experience to, I, I was able to touch one that, that came really close and, and sort of put his nose up, almost as though inviting us to touch. Yeah. And it didn't shy away when we touched, that, that was just amazing. But I understand that in previous years, we haven't had such a good relationship with whales. No, I mean, with, with with all great whales um, the history is awful we we hunted them and we hunted them almost to extinction if we hadn't protected them when we had we would have lost a lot of the biggest animals on the planet and i find that extraordinary really hard to believe that we can do it gray whales were hunted to the point where no one can agree on the exact figure it was certainly hundreds some say as low as 160 left um, and it was awful they used to park the big ships outside san ignacio lagoon and then the whalers would row in because uh, they couldn't get the ships over the shallow entrance. They'd row in in, in uh, rowing boats, whaling boats that were the same size as the boats we went watching them in. And they would harpoon the whales. And, and when they harpooned one whale, others would come and, and try and help it and they would get harpooned as well. But what was extraordinary was that the whales would fight back and the whalers called them devil fish because they would hit the boats with their heads and smash them with their tails and breach, leap out of the water onto them. And many whalers lost their lives. So they were considered really dangerous animals. 
and it was a dangerous occupation hunting them. But nowadays, and it's within the living memory of a, a grey whale, um, we're going in the lagoon in the same size boats and yet they seem to have forgiven us, they treat us as old friends, it's quite extraordinary. And didn't you say that some of the whales could be ones that are still alive from the times when whaling happened? Yeah, some of the older ones, I mean we don't really know how long they live but we're, we're talking 70 to 90 years and the last whales, the grey whales were hunted you know, within that period so certainly some of them around, some of the older ones will remember those days um, I, I always, it makes me feel very humble the fact that you know we can be so cruel to them and yet we expect them to understand we don't mean any harm now and we don't mean them harm now but they do seem to treat us with, with, with that sort of respect. They were certainly very gentle around the boats and they, they really did seem to be inquisitive and interested in the boats and there was no feeling at all that even, even so some of the whales were getting a little feisty with each other I think there was some rumbunctiousness uh, amongst some of the males, maybe, but I never felt in any danger. That was sort of away from the boats. It was no, they're amazingly careful around the boats. I mean, we don't know how much they understand about us, what they think we are, or what they make of us. But you can see them manoeuvring. That you know, one swipe of one of those tails, we'd all be in the water, no problem at all. Um, but you can see them manoeuvring, even though they're moving quite fast. They can turn on a sixpence but they bring the tail down and they don't hit the boat. Whether they do actually understand and treat us gently or not, I don't know. It certainly <laughs> feels like that when you're there. Yeah. Um, we've also had some amazing um, encounters with big pods of dolphin. And it made me think that actually, while I'm incredibly lucky to be on this trip and, and to be seeing the whales and dolphins here, actually you don't have to go too far from home to see whales and dolphins around the UK. No, I mean, Baja is, is, a, is exceptional because you've got so many different species and so many of them, but, you know, you can see whales. Oh, well, actually, what's interesting about that is that in the old days, before whaling, you know, we, we went into San Ignacio Lagoon and we were seeing blows all over the place. They're spouting everywhere, whale there, whale there. You know, you couldn't count them. That's what it used to be like in many parts of the world. Uh, it's not like that in most parts of the world now because there are just fewer of them, but you can still see them and particularly off the west coast of Britain, west coast of Scotland and Ireland in particular. Um, but around the whole of Britain you can see all sorts of different species and minke whales I've, I've seen really quite frequently, bottlenose dolphins, common dolphins, there are a few hotspots for Risso's dolphins and Atlantic white-sided dolphins and then every so often we get humpbacks, uh, fin whales and there, there are killer whales being seen regularly as well, even from the shore. A lot of people actually spend a lot of their time in Britain sitting, the weather's not quite as nice as it is here of course, <laughs> sitting in the cold and the rain with their binoculars and telescopes on cliff tops and they're often rewarded with whale sightings. I know that uh, Shetland is a particularly good spot and um, I'm, I'm hoping to go back up there again to, to see some, but we've seen minke whales off the, uh, in the Western Isles off the coast of Scotland as well. And, uh, and I know dolphins can be found at various places around. There's some that can be found in Wales. And Yeah, there's bottlenose dolphin populations. There's certain places you can go to um, where you're pretty much guaranteed to see them. So if you go to, for example, Newquay in Cardigan Bay, there's a bottlenose dolphin population. They see them on pretty much every trip. You can go to the Murray Firth. Um, you can even stand on the shore at a place called Channonry Point. And if you get the tide right, then the dolphins will just be a few yards away. Um, leaping about right there where you're standing. It's, it's very easy, you know, when you, when you travel to think that you've got to travel afar to see wildlife and, it, and you know, too easy to forget there's some fantastic wildlife at home in yes. Britain and um, just need a little bit of patience and a bit of research to work out where to go and chances are you'll see something interesting. Something I hadn't realised was you've written a an amazing number of books about wildlife and about conservation. Um, I have the Whales and Dolphin uh, Identification Guide at home. I hadn't realised it was one that you'd actually written. So. <laughs> oh, well, that's probably a good thing because that's a really old guide now. It's all out of date. <laughs> but I understand there's a new one coming at yeah, some point soon. Yeah. Over the years, you've been involved in a massive amount of 
conservation work and um, awareness raising work around all sorts of animals, not just the whales and dolphins. I mean, this is something that's come home to me while we've been on this trip. Some of the things you said about the current state of how people are treating whales in the world, but, but that extends to other animals as well. And I know that you, um, I remember watching it myself, knowing that you did the series uh, Last Chance to See with Stephen Fry, which was based on originally on a project that you did with Douglas Adams. Mm. So could you tell me a little bit about the Last Chance to See series? Yeah, the idea behind that was um, really to get conservation to people who wouldn't normally read a book or listen to a radio series or watch a television series about conservation. So the trouble with conservationists is we're always talking to people who feel the same way and who already feel strongly about it and talk, preaching to the converted. So the idea was to try and creep up on people with um, you know famous names like Douglas Adams and Stephen Fry and a bit of humour and travelogue and so on and have a serious message throughout. Um, so to get to people who wouldn't even dream of, of reading a book or watching a TV series about the subject. So uh, what, what it was was a year, well, I spent a year travelling around the world with Douglas Adams looking for, in the end it was eight different endangered species, meeting all the people trying to protect them and um, trying to you know get an insight into what's involved, what the problems are. They were a you know, weird and wonderful collection of different animals. There was a, a parrot called a kakapo that, like most birds in New Zealand, has forgotten how to fly, but it's forgotten that it's forgotten how to fly. So it, it climbs up trees and jumps and flies like a brick and lands in a heap of feathers on the ground. And there's, a, there's another one we went to look for called an Amazonian manatee, which looks a bit like if you took a seal and you pumped it full of air and then put a bloodhound's a snout on the end, you've got a manatee. I mean, you couldn't make some of these creatures up. And we hoped that they would be a way of drawing people in and talking about various issues. Like with the kakapo, the issue was introducing alien predators. So when people arrived in New Zealand, where it lives, they brought cats and rats and possums, and the kakapo had never met a predator before. And so, like all the other flightless birds of New Zealand, they were in really big trouble. And the manatee you know, it gave us an excuse to talk about rainforest destruction in the Amazon and hunting and all that kind of thing. So that was the thinking behind it. And then, um, very sadly, Douglas Adams died uh, a number of years after we did that, that journey. And Stephen Fry took his place exactly 20 years later. And uh, so we went back, did the same journey, uh, looked for the same animals, and, um, and in many cases met the same people who amazingly were still in the field trying to wow. protect them that you know people who've devoted their lives to protecting these species I, I really believe that many many animals around today that have been ha facing huge threats are only here because there are individuals who've devoted their lives to trying to protect them and um, what was shocking was that out of eight species we picked for this project two have now become extinct so we've lost the Yangtze River dolphin which used to live in the Yangtze River in China, and the northern white rhino, which is extinct in the wild. There's two left in a, in a captive situation, and they, they're not breeding, they're going to go very soon too. So out of eight, we lost a quarter of them, and that, that was really shocking to me. That is so, so sad. Oh, we were, I think we worked out, I can't remember exactly, we worked out that if we did one endangered species, a programme about one endangered species every day, uh, using all the endangered species in the world it would run for hundreds of years the That's series shocking. I mean there were so many to choose from we picked ones that were that sort of represented key conservation issues and we also picked a, a range of mammals and birds and reptiles and different continents so there's a bit of variety um, but yeah we, we were spoilt for choice which is an awful way to put it there were so many yeah. animals facing extinction these were hugely successful um, series the, the first one was a radio broadcast and then the second was an actual TV was it a BBC production yeah BBC 2 yeah I'm sure that by doing that you've touched so many more people and made them or given them food for thought so this might sound a bit of a controversial question why do we need to save these species from extinction? Why do we need to look after species? How long have we got? <laughs> there, are, there are lots of reasons, and, and again, in no particular order. There's a moral reason. We have no right to ride roughshod over the planet and wipe everything out just because it suits us, because 
it suits us for economic growth which is the sort of thing that politicians seem to be obsessed with you know why should we lose tigers rhinos elephants and so on um, there's a practical reason in that if you imagine the best way to describe it is, is if you think of an ecosystem do you remember that old game of pick a sticks where you drop the sticks on a table and you have to pull one out at a time and and not let the, the the whole pile collapse if you imagine each stick being a species and you might be able to pull one out you might be able to make one extinct and the, the pile stays roughly the same but at some point you're going to pull one out and the whole thing will collapse and once you start having collapsing ecosystems you're going to lose a lot more species but we're going to be in trouble and a lot of environmental issues are as much about humans as they're about wildlife you know there are very very practical reasons for conservation global warming for example if I had to pick one issue that is that overrides all the others, it would be global warming. And even the UN is warning if we don't get our act together in the next 12 years, then the whole world will change. There'll be millions, maybe billions of people moving around the planet looking for somewhere with water, somewhere they can live. Um, you know, the wildlife will, will suffer. You can't even begin to imagine what will happen to all the wildlife. So, you know, it's our own survival as well as caring about individual animals. Um, and there are, there are many other reasons. I mean, cruelty is one. My, one of my big passions is whaling. And first off, we don't want whales to become extinct, any species to become extinct. But second off, there is no humane way of killing a whale. And they're still using explosive harpoons that blow a hole in the side of the whale and it bleeds to death. You know, in the 21st century, we, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, and there are many other reasons we, we, you know, our medicines are all derived from natural products, from plants and so on. The more we wipe out, the less, the fewer options we have for new medicines and for adapting existing medicines. Our food relies on insects to pollinate crops. You know, we're wiping out bees like there's no tomorrow. It's, there has to come a point where we're going to pay the price. So there's a whole gamut of possible of reasons why conservation is critical. It's not just because we love wildlife, although we do. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I wonder is, is there things that we can do on an individual scale? Because it feels almost like, and you've been so active, you've done so much with your life in trying to save animals and um, make the world a better place for them. But for the regular person who doesn't have the opportunities or the influence that you've had, um, how can we, what can we do to... I can, I can be very specific about this. Okay. I feel really strongly there are three things I can categorically say that every one of us should be doing. Um, and in no particular order. One is to pick a subject or a species or a part of the world or an issue that you feel really strongly about, whether it's orangutans or rainforest destruction or whales or sharks or whatever identify a, a charity that is working to protect them um, and I personally prefer the smaller charities that are specialized that uh, tend to be more efficient and know more about what they're doing um, and then support it in any way you can not just financially but give your time give your expertise they often need experts in different subjects and get involved that's the first thing the second thing is to uh, get in touch with your MP and get them involved and ask them questions about any issues you feel strongly about ask them to raise them in Parliament um, tell them how strongly you feel about it one of the big challenges is is government doesn't get conservation there's no party in the UK apart from the Green Party obviously that understands how important conservation is I think there's an element of many MPs still think of us conservationists as bunny hugging weirdos in open toed sandals you know that it's a very serious subject and uh, if we don't get our act together we're going to lose a lot of species and it will affect us as well so get your MP involved get to know your MP and the third thing is live a green life and encourage other people around you your friends and your relatives to do the same thing you know um, don't use plastic bags um, think about what you're buying think about how you're traveling um, and all the things are very easy to research what you should do to live a green life and every, if everyone around you does that that has a ripple effect and if you can do those three things you'll have a big impact on the natural world 
So we're sitting here and I've, we, we've been almost hit a few times by pelicans yeah, we have, we? flying into, so there's a light on the side of the boat, we're sitting here at night and there's lots of fish that have been attracted to the light and pelicans, brown pelicans have been attracted in to the fish and it's just amazing to see them swimming and feeding, seeing them open their, their mouths and pull in the fish, it's not going so well for the fish. Just to finish on, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the bird life that we've seen, because although this has been a, a pretty much an ocean-going journey that we've done from San Diego down to Cabo San Lucas, while doing a short journey up into the Sea of Cortez for uh, the last couple of days, we've actually seen quite a lot of bird life, either at sea or on some of the islands that we've stopped at. Could you pick out a couple of species that we've seen? Um, well, we've seen a lot, haven't we? A lot of a lot of variety, and, and it is sort of along the way. Not, we're not a bird watching trip, but um, while we're travelling at sea, we're seeing. Uh, the last few days, we've been seeing things like blue-footed boobies, which are wonderful birds, and uh, uh, brown boobies related to our gannets back home. The, the brown pelicans you mentioned are pretty much everywhere we go. I mean, to me, it, it, it doesn't. It's not, it, I don't get particular pleasure about seeing rare birds I just love watching birds or any other wildlife and you know brown pelicans are interesting in their own right because unlike all the other pelicans in the world they dive so the other pelicans will sit on the water and fish but brown pelicans will actually dive from a height like a gannet does and they they have to do it in a certain way they if you, if you watch them really carefully they'll dive down they twist to the right just as they hit the water and if they don't do that, there's a risk of crushing their esophagus and trachea, which are on the left-hand side. Um, and if they get the twist wrong, they can kill themselves. You know, it's a very dangerous thing to do, and they're doing it all day long. When you think they hit the water quite fast, and they open these huge beaks, which actually always remind me of baleen whales with their big throats. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to catch the fish and stop suddenly. So, to me, I love nothing more than just watching a common bird like this you know, watching them now, they're diving in the water right next to us and the fish in the light. I think it's, I could watch this for hours, it's fascinating. But we've, we've, had, we've been lucky, we had a good variety of stuff, we've had lots of nice sheer water, we had a, a huge number of black storm petrels this morning, beautiful glassy calm sea, that was wonderful. and as we were travelling along quite early this morning, we suddenly started seeing, first of all, a few, then dozens, then hundreds of black storm petrels flying over the sea, very low, uh, right in front of us. And of course on the landings we've had, um, I think yesterday was probably my favourite landing of the trip, to Santa Catalina Island, where there were lots of cacti and lots of bird life. And we saw, I think we saw 20 odd species of birds while we were there and some, some beautiful ones. I've got a photo there a couple of years ago, I was trying to get it yesterday and, and failed, of a, a northern cardinal, which is brilliant red, on a really deep green cactus against this gorgeous, we've got this, these wonderful deep blue skies all day long. I mean, those three colors together yeah, and are that, stunning. It felt like it was so close to happening. <laughs> yeah, and, it nearly just, happened. Yes. I saw the cardinal. <laughs> I couldn't quite get the photograph, but that's all part of the fun of being a wildlife photographer. And you know, we could hear the Gila woodpeckers calling all morning and um, we saw Verdin and Northern Mockingbird and White Winged Dove and it's just wonderful and that yeah. was just in a couple of hours yeah absolutely amazing this has been a fantastic fantastic trip um thank you so much for your time great Mark. pleasure uh, really lovely speaking with you and to hear all about the things you've done and actually really inspirational to talk to you um and i hope that all of the listeners will will go out and do at least one of the three things if not all three of the things i hope so very much we all need to do our bit absolutely thank you very much thank you if you'd like to find out more about Mark's conservation work or about the wildlife tours he runs, visit his website at markcarwardine.com. And there you can also find links to some of the more humorous moments that he's faced while making wildlife programmes. You can find a list of the whales and birds I saw while on the tour in the show notes, and I'll be speaking more about the birds of Baja California in future episodes. I'd like to thank the other passengers for their great company during the tour and to the crew of Spirit of Adventure for their friendliness and professionalism, and for everyone's cooperation while I was recording the interview that night. I'd love to know what birds you've seen this week. 
Join our Facebook group to discuss this week's episode or post your photos of the birds you've seen. I really do enjoy hearing your tales, so come and join the conversation there. Find us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash casual birder podcast. Follow me on Twitter at casual birder pod or on Instagram at casual birder podcast. You can email me at casualbirderpod at gmail.com. Make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing to the show. Subscribing is free and you can do it wherever you listen. And if you enjoy the show, please consider posting about it on social media. Personal recommendation is such a valuable way of helping others to find the show. Thank you to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeved Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at www.dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast. <laughs>